have this name Margaret Willison and every class when you do up there is at least three Margarets and every official thing you put your name down on there were all those other Margaret Willisons. One day I thought don't like how women we inherit our father's names so and you get married and have a husband's name. I thought well why should I have to live with my father's name? Why can't I have my own name? I had a friend who had a little tiger moth that I used to jump out of. So I thought, why not Margaret Moth? I had a tumor since I was about eight years old. It was still a tumor, but I don't know that I ever really thought ahead that I want to be a photographer or a tumor. I didn't really even know about tumor in those days. Well, I first met Margaret when she was transferred to Dunedin, where I was working at, a, at, a, at the television station. We got to actually know each other quite well, and um, working together, and she introduced me to skydiving. In those days, we'd have done a, a, a day's work in the television news room, and then if the weather was fine, we'd check the conditions and hire a plane and, and get in maybe two, three jumps, four jumps in an evening. Margaret's the first cameraman who was female in um, both New Zealand and Australia. It was actually a unique position that she had. Margaret is different in many ways, but Margaret is sort of someone who's from a different era. I've always thought of her as someone who comes from Victorian times. I've always had history and all the time, ever since I was young and read history, I used to think, but what was it really like? What would it really have been like to be there? I think with Margaret, you look at Margaret's work and she got her stuff because she took those chances. And I think for us camera guys, you have to take that chance. If you want to get those pictures, you've got to get close to it, you've got to get out there, and you've got to make that leap. When I first met Margaret Moth back in the late 1990s in the Balkans during the, the Kosovo uh, war, I, I just you know, didn't know what to make of her. I couldn't understand what she was saying most of the time, and she looked so strange. But after we'd worked with each other for several weeks, several months, we became really tight. I first worked with Margaret in Sarajevo in 1992. It was when the Bosnian War was really who just starting. I mean, who is the chain of command? She is this larger than life character that uh, I was, uh, you know, quite intimidated by before I actually met her. You know, she was this extraordinary looking girl. She has this dark, dark hair, dark eyes, wears dark clothes. And you know what? Sleeps with her dark combat boots on. Margaret would wear any colour as long as it was black. She just wore black all the time. I think her socks were black. As soon as we met and we started to work, I knew that Margaret is simply committed, passionate, dedicated, and loves this job more than anything. The first time I met Margaret, we uh, met up in Moscow to, uh, we were assigned to cover the war in the Republic of Georgia. There was this uh, demonstration by Georgian citizens. Now I had just left, I had been there, we were filming all this stuff together and I go away and the gunman, uh, 
the militiamen for the new government that was trying to take over opened fire on the crowd. I'm back at the hotel and all of a sudden Margaret and the other, all the other international camera crews come rushing back to the uh, hotel. And this Australian guy says to me, my God, I, you're Margaret, it's amazing. I said, why, what happened? They said, well, we were all standing there and all of a sudden the militiamen stride forward and start firing into the crowd. So we all dive behind the cars, he says to me. Uh, he says, and I'm, as I'm sitting there crouched behind the car with my camera in my arms, I see a shadow across my hands and I look up and it was Margaret standing there out in front of the cars, totally unafraid, filming the gunmen. A CNN team covering the war in Sarajevo has come under attack. CNN camerawoman Margaret Moth and CNN correspondent Mark Delmage were wounded this morning by sniper fire. They were in a car patrolling the streets when they came under fire. CNN Stefan Katsonis was with Moth and Delmage during the shooting, and he joins us now from Sarajevo by phone. Hello. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that Margaret is still in surgery right now. And the doctors have now said that it's not guaranteed that she will survive this. Her severe injuries are to her head and throat are very serious. Uh, even if she does survive it, her life will be very different from now on. We don't know on that road many, many times before. And we did get shot at other times, but not right at this point. Someone shot, I think, three rounds into the van. I didn't hear them, you know, so I guess I got hit by the first one. <laughs> and at that moment, all of a sudden, it sounded like five people came up to the car with ball hammers. Prow! The whole car went, and I felt this mist of glass. I don't remember the actual shot, but I remember it must have knocked me over onto Mark. He was sitting next to me, and I just, maybe a second, I don't remember anything. Margaret is, has, has slumped over Mark's shoulder, and his shirt is full of her blood. My face, it felt like my face was falling off. I remember all here, I was trying to hold it on. And she's holding on like that, and she's looking a little bit more knocked out or something. I knew I had to keep calm, and I knew I had to stay conscious. If I don't unconscious, I'll stop breathing. And I knew that. I actually picked up the call uh, when it came. Um, and uh, was told that Margaret had been shot in the face. This was the most traumatic situation that I dealt with during my 11 years as president of CNN. I learned that Margaret had suffered grave wounds, that uh, it was unlikely that she would survive her wounds. We were able to fly her out via a UN plane um, to Germany. And when she got to Germany, it was decided that she could fly on, so we medevaced her out. She was missing a pretty significant portion of the left side of her jaw, and uh, we knew that that had to be replaced, and we had a whole series of procedures that needed to be done to get her to the point where she had something that worked. She was mi also missing a pretty fair portion of her, the base of her tongue. She just didn't look like Margaret. It, to me, it, I thought it was not Margaret. She really looked horrible. She was completely enveloped in bandages, her face was unrecognizable. She was so badly wounded. And the only thing I recognized was her hands. She had very distinctive, strong hands. And all you could see were her two big blue bright eyes just staring out. She couldn't speak, so she would write notes. I still have those papers. I still have those notes. Of things that she wanted to know, and one of the questions was, do I look like a monster? 
And I remember distinctly that it was while we were visiting her that the assignment editor from the international desk called and he said to me, so, Christiane, you ready to go back to Sarajevo? And I thought, apart from, I felt, how insensitive can you be? I mean, I'm in this room with my colleague who's been wounded beyond recognition. And then I said, yes. I said I'd go back, and I know to this day that if I hadn't said yes then, I probably never would have gone back, and I never would have done this career. But I said yes because I couldn't say no. 